If you want to turn there, we're going to be looking at 2 Peter chapter 3, the last two verses, 17 and 18. Uh, this morning, I want to speak to you on the uh, subject, frozen in your comfort zone. I've come across a lot of Christians over the years that fit into that. And there was a period of time when I was frozen in my comfort zone, and God had to uh, get me out of it. Uh, tonight, I want to speak to you on this subject, the Calvary Road. The Calvary Road. What did it mean the moment you got saved? And uh, what did God expect of you? Now, some time ago, I preached on uh, children who disappoint their parents and how to handle children who disappoint their parents. I thought I would, uh, in answer to a, uh, to a child's request, I thought I might preach on when parents disappoint their children. And do that tonight. Okay, so... I want to thank all of those that filled in for me while I was gone, Brother Dean, uh, Brother Dan Thompson, and uh, Brother Dan is uh, working on uh, developing his uh, preaching skills, and I'm doing my best to help him. So turn in 2 Peter chapter 3, 17 and 18, listen to the words, ye therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before. Beware lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Peter was dealing with becoming and remaining a mature believer. The Apostle Paul also dealt with this very same subject on numerous occasions, saying that they should have been uh, eating meat instead of, you know, still holding on to the baby bottle. For example, in Hebrews 5, 12, the writer says, For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. So the problem was spiritual childishness. And it seems to have been as much a problem in the early church as it is even today. So interestingly, uh, you've probably noticed this, physical growth takes place Pretty much on its own, doesn't it? You have to be a little careful, but if you're not careful, it'll grow here, you know, instead of the uh, other way. Uh, but the intellectual, emotional, and spiritual growth of an individual uh, seems to take more time, more attention, and it's more individualized, I believe. So of these three, the spiritual maturity seems to be the most elusive and uh, uh, of the four areas, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, we're told that Jesus actually increased in these areas. And uh, we find out that people that don't increase have what we call spiritually stunted growth. Now, wh why is the spiritual so important? Well, years ago, one of my preacher friends told me, he said, think of it this way. The spiritual is the hub. The, the physical, emotional, and intellectual are spokes that come out of the hub. They're all dependent on that hub. So I'm going to be speaking to you on the subject, frozen in your comfort zone. The first thing we need to do is understand what we mean by comfort because words change in meanings over the years. Um, the Old Testament word for comfort, and two, two words stand out. One means to breathe strongly, to sorrow for, or to sorrow with someone, to console an individual, or to try to ease a situation. Uh, the other word translated comfort in the Old Testament means to support, to establish, to hold up, to refresh, or to strengthen someone. In the New Testament, one of the words, paraklesis, is the same word that Jesus used for the Holy Spirit means to implore, to give solace, to entreat, or to console. And uh, like I say, Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit as the comforter. There's another Greek word. It simply means to have courage. And it comes from a word which means to be bold in a situation requiring it, to be daring without thought of your own safety, and to be courageous in facing whatever the situation brings. The last of the three words in the New Testament is a word which means to draw near, to support, encourage, console, or comfort. 
So why do I give you these? Well, I want you to see that the word comfort and comfortable do not mean what they did when the King James Bible was translated. We certainly don't necessarily think of all that. Whenever I've been counseling over the years, over 3,000 counselees, one of the things that I've noticed is that whenever they come in, they want me to give them comfort. And sometimes when they tell me that, I ask them the question, what do you mean by comfort? Well, you know, make things better for me. <laughs> well, I may not be able to do that, right? <laughs> okay, relieve some of the pressure. Well, both Old Testament and New Testament words, I think they are clearly uh, dealing with the ideas of sharing, supporting, encouraging, enabling. And in the case of the Holy Spirit, they deal with equipping and empowering. So what are the modern meanings of comfort? How has the word changed over the years? Well, they're more self-centered, more focused on an undisturbed status and related to more ease and pleasure. For example, the dictionary uses the verb form of comfort to soothe, to ease physically, to relieve a condition of feeling physically uh, the pleasure of ease. Another dictionary definition, uh, looking at the word comfort as an adjective, uh, physical ease, free from stress, feeling at ease, relaxing, mental ease. So today the word comfortable has been adopted as an expression of what someone does not want to do or is afraid to do. You will often hear people say whenever you confront them with a, a, a challenge, uh, I'm not comfortable with that. And my, myself have said that at some point in my early spiritual growth. The key phrase is usually stated the way a lady used it on me in my early church period here at Glens Falls Bible Baptist Church. She was a teacher in our Sunday school. She was having a little bit of difficulty controlling her class, and uh, she sensed uh, uh, that she was not going to be able to handle it. And when she came to me, she was troubled. And so I asked her, I said, what's the problem? She says, I'm not comfortable doing this anymore. You need to get somebody else to do it. And I told her, you're not making sense. And she said, well, you know, I'm not comfortable and that's all there is to it. It's up to you. So hoping to help her move towards spiritual maturity, I gave this response. Well, the church is not here to provide you comfort in the way you're talking about it. The church is here to provide you an opportunity for responsible service and God will strengthen you and enable you to do it. Can we work through this? Well, she stood up, stormed out of the office, and slammed the door, and I never saw her again. <laughs> well, so I went to teach her a Sunday school class, and at that time, Bob Davenport was here, so I turned over the adult class to him. He was always capable of just jumping in and filling in. So why do people get frozen into a comfort zone that they refuse to abandon? Well, let's put out an outline that I think will help us answer that question. Number one, before we go any farther, let's define comfort zone, okay? We need to know what the comfort zone is. Psychologists define it this way. <clears throat> this comes from the uh, uh, psychological word study from Wikipedia. Quoting now, a comfort zone is a psychological state in which things feel familiar to a person and they are at ease and in control of their environment, experiencing low levels of anxiety and stress. In this zone, a steady level of performance is possible, end of quotation. Well, what is the problem in that situation? Here's the problem. A person frozen in the comfort zone seldom reaches full potential. Think about it. A person who just stays in the comfort zone begins to function perfunctorily, habitually, routinely, ritually even. And the comfort zone becomes a filter for straining out the challenges needed for growth. One thing that you learn from looking at the life of the Apostle Paul is he rose dramatically and rapidly to a high spiritual level, mainly because he suffered. Remember what God told Ananias in Acts chapter 9? He said, you go and meet him. And Ananias said, no, 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 wait a minute. I know this guy. 
He kills Christians. I'm, I'm not interested in that. God said, you go ahead. He's blind right now. I want you to bring him home. He said, I've got to show him what great things he must suffer for my sake. And it's interesting if you read First and Second Peter, there's absolutely no indication in Peter's writings that you can grow without suffering. So the steady level of performance that a person performs when he's not reaching his potential is it's not his highest level of performance. It feeds back into the pleasure idea. Biblical character usually did not say they were uncomfortable doing what God told them to do. They often acted like it. Remember Moses' excuse-making from the burning bush? <laughs> Those who did uh, feel uncomfortable found themselves locked into a level of immaturity which threatened their fellowship with God. In an article entitled, Don't Let Your Comfort Zone Become Your Forever Home, Michael Kuslan said this. <clears throat> he says, uh, when I launched my business, there were many unknowns. Striking out on my own was risky. However, the alternative would be a life sentence in my comfort zone. End of quotation. So comfort zone defined it. It's a place of comfort. A place where you can develop habits and keep doing the same thing over and over again. A place where you avoid any challenge to your present level in an attempt to move you to a higher level. That's your comfort zone. Uh, let's look number two in your outline. Let's call this comfort zone deficits. Comfort zone deficits. What does it cost a person to stay in his or her comfort zone? Well, think about some of the biblical characters. Moses, the burning bush experience was God's call to him to step out of his comfort zone. And he didn't want to do it. He tried to explain to God why God was making a big mistake. What about Joseph? Being sold into Egyptian slavery by his own brothers actually moved him out of his comfort zone. That's where he did the most growing, was out of his comfort zone. What about Matthew? Jesus walking along, he saw him at customs, and he said, follow me. And what Jesus actually did was invite the tax collector to get out of his comfort zone. And that's exactly what he did. What about Saul of Tarsus? Meeting Jesus in a dramatic way on the Damascus Road certainly forced him out of his comfort zone. Now, you and I are enjoying benefits today, which resulted because all four of these people got out of their comfort zone. We have some tremendous benefits because of that. So some costs that you will pay if you remain frozen in your comfort zone are pretty, are pretty dramatic. These are high costs. You ready for these? If you say, well, I don't want to get out of my comfort zone. I just want to do what I'm doing. I'll come and sit in the pew, throw something into the offering plate, listen to the message, <clears throat> and then I'll go home and act like nothing has changed. So you're in your comfort zone. So what is the high cost of being in your comfort zone? Number one, permanent ignorance of what you could have become and achieved. Permanent ignorance of what you could have become and achieved. <clears throat> Number two, loss of skill in developing unrealized potential. Loss of skills in developing unrealized potential. You see, effectiveness is the result of applying skills to life's situations over a long period of time. What we'd like to do is we have a crisis come up and we just like to say, be gone, and suddenly the crisis disappears, right? But what we need to do is recognize that every crisis is an opportunity to draw greater strength from the resources of God than we would do if we didn't have a challenge. What's another cost <clears throat> for 
for remaining frozen in your comfort zone. Unrecoverable opportunities to serve. Unrecoverable opportunities to serve. I was thinking of all we've accomplished in the former Soviet Union. And I remember the night that Bob Billings, who worked as Assistant Secretary of State under Ronald Reagan, he walked in the back door and I recognized him immediately and I went and I spoke to him and I said, boy, Dr. Billings, I'm so glad to see you. Would you like to preach tonight? And he said, no, he said, I'm here to hear you. <laughs> and I said, well, okay. And he said, after the service is over, he said, I want to give you a challenge. And I said, okay. He said, are you up to challenges? And I said, uh, yeah, without knowing what the challenge <laughs> was. <laughs> so at the end of the service, he took me into a room and he said, Ronald Reagan has uh, assigned me the responsibility of getting 300 preachers to come to Washington to meet with him personally in one of the hotels and be high security. You can't tell anybody about the meeting and you can't tell anybody what happens in the meeting. And if you do, the president will deny that the meeting ever took place. It's one of those mission impossible <laughs> type assignments, you know? So I'm thinking to myself, I said, boy, Doc, that's quite a challenge. He said, are you up to it? And I said, yeah. So I flew to Washington. We went into one of the big hotels there and it was security everywhere. And the uh, president came out, he was introduced. They prayed, hail to the chief. And he told us, he said, he said, I've got a four-point plan for bringing down the evil empire, the Soviet Union. <clears throat> Number one, we're going to have uh, war games with the uh, uh, allies, and we're going to announce to the Soviet Union that we're getting rid of our obsolete weaponry because the CIA says um, uh, that our obsolete weaponry is superior to anything the Soviet Union has. So we want them to know we have something even better than what they're seeing. So he said, that's point number one. <clears throat> he said, point number two, he said, Ollie North is trying to raise money outside of Congress because the Democrats won't vote for it. He's trying to raise money outside of Congress to fund the Strategic Defense Initiative, which the media calls Star Wars. Uh, anytime a missile is launched anywhere on the face of the earth, anywhere, Within 30 seconds, this unit can determine whether it's headed to the United States. In less than a minute, it can shoot it, shoot it down with laser technology. And he said then, number three, is uh, he said we're going to, to release from prison the most skilled counterfeiters, and we will ask them to counterfeit billions of rubles and flood the Soviet Union with those billions of of counterfeit rubles and bring their economy crashing. He said, now for you, man, you're here for a different reason. Uh, George Washington, he said, has written or has stated, you cannot enslave a Bible reading people. So he said, all 300 of you, I'm asking you to commit to bringing to the Soviet Union and distributing free of charge to the citizens a million copies of the Word of God per person. So that's 300 million copies of the Word of God. He said, you have to raise your own money. You have to buy your own Bibles. You have to transport those Bibles. And he said, if you are caught or captured, the secretary and I will disavow any knowledge of what you're doing. You're on your own, except that you have God on your side, President Reagan said. So we left. <clears throat> And uh, for the next 12 years, <laughs> I made trip after trip to the Soviet Union. Now we have a, a massive ministry operating in the Soviet Union. I often wonder what, what would have happened had I said, I'm sorry, Doc, I'm not interested in that. And the president gave us all. He said, look, if you guys realize how dangerous this is, anybody wants to stand up and walk out now, nobody will think evil or ill of you at all. You can leave. And that'll be it. Nobody left. All 300 people remained. You know, that if, I had a, if I'd avoided that, that would have been an unrecoverable opportunity. Mm -hmm. And right now, we have a seminary. Our church promotes it. We have a Bible college. 
we have a summer camp, first of all, for saved teenagers, teaching them how to be soul winners. And then the second summer camp is for unsaved teenagers that they will be the uh, ones to leap into Christ. Then we have orphanage. You just think about it. Every time you put money in that Sunday school offering, it goes to do that. We have other churches and other groups and other individuals that support that. We could always use more. If we took in uh, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a month, we could still we could still spend it. You know, unrecoverable opportunity. Boy, I'm glad I didn't turn that opportunity down. Man, once some opportunities are forfeited by staying comfortable, those opportunities may never reappear for you. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Well, there's another penalty you'll have to pay if uh, you stay frozen in your comfort zone. <clears throat> and that is the joy you will experience in having been a blessing to others. I've never been blessed extensively by people who live in a comfort zone. The greatest blessings I've gotten have been people who've stepped out. I'm trusting God. I know it's dangerous. I know it could be difficult, but I'm trusting God. You see, comfort zone believers do not contribute significantly to being a blessing to other people. But there's a, let me give you a final, <clears throat> a final uh, cost of remaining in your comfort zone. Limited eternal rewards from our Savior. Limited eternal rewards from our Savior. Now, those who are frozen in a selfish comfort zone are not going to get the same rewards as those who by faith willingly stepped out of that comfort zone and submitted themselves to the challenges of obedience. But I don't know about you, but I want to hear well done and good and faithful servant. Mm -hmm. And um, there are numerous deficits in the comfort zone. Um, but staying in that comfort zone forfeits a lot of benefits some of them forever. Put out number three in your outline. Comfort zone deserted. Jesus walked by the fishermen and he said to each one of them, follow me. What he was saying is leave your comfort zone. Trust me. Don't trust what people say about me. Trust me. And that'll expand your potential. He said, you think you're catching fish now? I'm going to make you fishers of men. I'm going to change your material accomplishments into spiritual accomplishments. Imagine the outcome had they not willingly deserted their comfort zone. <laughs> In his article, Five Reasons You Need to Get Out of Your Comfort Zone, a man by the name of Harvey Doschendorf, he gives this warning, and I'm quoting, but the more time we spend in this comfort zone, the more difficult it will be to break free from that space, end of quotation. Then he gives five reasons that you need to break free from your comfort zone. I thought they were good, I'll share them with you. Number one, it develops your inner strength. He tells us that even if we had, if we fail at something we've attempted, we at least have an experience that we can draw upon for future effort. Personal strength is not developed in the comfort zone. So when God called his servants to do the uncomfortable, he promised that he would give them strength to do what he asked them to do. So why leave the comfort zone? Number one, it develops your inner strength. Number two, it builds your own confidence. Every goal that you set, every goal that you achieve strengthens your sense of worth and confidence. And for the believer, we can say, I can do all things through Christ with strength in me. A lot of people quote that when they've had an immediate success. But you don't hear them talking about it when the challenge hits them, right? <laughs> no one increases strength by languishing in the comfort zone of familiarity. No one increases strength by languishing in the comfort zone of familiarity. So he tells us, uh, Dorschendorf does, that we need to desert the comfort zone. Number three, he says, when we do so, it makes us more adaptable to change. 
It makes us more adaptable to change. The more time we spend in our comfort zone, the scarier new territory will appear to us, Dushendorf says. Jesus knows that fear often chains us to the familiar elements in our comfort zone, forcing us to forfeit the challenges that will bring us closer to him. When Jesus told his disciples, follow me, he was offering both opportunity and enablement to adjust to change. I mean, you look at those disciples. Their whole lives reported in the four gospels as nothing but change. It was constantly changing. And sometimes they were scared to death of the change, but they were following one who had no concern for fear. He calls us to flee our comfort zone. Let me give you a fourth thing, Doshendorf says. Um, when we abandon our comfort zone, it makes us more creative. Um, creativity doesn't develop in a person hanging out in the comfort zone. The tried and true require only repetition, not invention. The people of Israel had never gone that way before. Moses said, you've never gone this way before. And what an opportunity. <laughs> Maximum creative potential is the result of willing submission to the will of God. Think about that. Maximum creative potential is the result of willing submission to the will of God. So when a person wants to do his own thing rather than finding out what God wants him to do, basically what he's doing is stealing from himself maximum creative potential. Number five, Dorschendorf says to abandon the comfort zone, he says, if you don't, you won't otherwise know what you could have been. You won't know what you could have been. Listen to this statement that he makes, quoting now, while taking the safe route is always tempting, it means paying a high price of regret down the road. Avoiding regret is perhaps the most compelling reason that we need to move out of our comfort zone. Isn't that powerful? I mean, I'm reading this stuff here, and I said, I wonder if these guys have studied the Bible. Sounds like they have, <laughs> you know. I thought about my life. <clears throat> I look back over, see, in a couple of weeks, I'll be 80. And I've been preaching since I was 13 or 14. And I asked myself why I have almost no regrets. I have one or two, you know, and they aren't really serious. And the answer seems to be a willingness to operate outside the arena in which I would be carnally comfortable. I mean, a lot of the things that I've accomplished, if you'd have told me when I was even in high school after I'd been saved a while and working with my pastor, if you'd have told me some of the things that I have done that I'd be doing them, I would have laughed in your face. I said, no, I could never do that. <laughs> and that's true, I couldn't. God gave me an opportunity, and he said, now, in order to do this, you got to get out of the comfort zone. Took me a while to catch on to that one. When we turn to Christ for salvation, we should be, we, we should expect this. We should be expecting to step outside the human comfort zone because there's absolutely nothing in the spiritual life, the one that's surrendered to the Lord, there's absolutely nothing that's common. I mean, God's going to do some amazing things in the lives of people who say, I'm not going to be going around telling people I'm not comfortable with it. I'm just going to see what God says, and I'm going to step out, and I'm going to trust him. And I'll tell you, there have been a lot of things that I could have said. I could have said. I'm not comfortable with that. That night when the president spoke to us in Washington, D.C., I'm sitting there thinking, what? I mean, when he's outlining these four steps and saying that we were a major part of the four steps, he was putting us on the same level as the, the people who are going to be firing the missiles and the people that were going to be, you know, driving the submarines and all that stuff. 
He said, what you're going to be doing is important because he said, our first president said, you cannot enslave a Bible reading people. He said, what you're going to do is important. Well, I'll tell you, I, I wanted to stand up <laughs> and I wanted to walk out. I never envisioned myself doing anything like that. But in order to do it, I had to step out of the comfort zone. I can tell you today, I'm glad I did. That night, uh, I, I don't think I was very happy about what I was hearing. <laughs> I looked over at Dr. Billings, one of Reagan's staff members, and I said, Doc, what do you think? And he said, I think we ought to go for it. It was just that little encouragement. I said, okay, let's go for it. So for the next 12 years, uh, we've been stopped. We've been arrested. <laughs> We've been detained, and every time we have gone into the Soviet Union, we've been followed by the KGB. I mean, what gets me is, is I, I, don't, I don't understand. If you're going to follow somebody, do you want them to know who you are? I, I don't know. Maybe in Russia they think differently. But all the KGB agents had on black suits, white shirt, black tie, black socks, black shoes, uh, black top coat if it was that kind of weather black hat and dark glasses. <laughs> and they always traveled in two. So we'd be walking down the road there. I was talking to one of my translators one day. I said, Midian, Nikolaeva. She said, Doc? I said, let's KGB behind us. No. Yeah. <laughs> she, I said, aren't they? No. She said, they're everywhere. <laughs> let's stand together for prayer. Lord, more than anything else, we don't want to pursue a comfortable Christian life devastating to our spiritual growth, devastating to our witness to Jesus Christ, devastating to the needs of our community, devastating to everybody close to us who's looking to us as an example. Help us to be an example of those who step out of the comfort zone, those who are willing to accept a challenge that seems impossible because we serve a God with whom all things are possible. As we open the altar, speak to our hearts now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.